Welcome back AP Chemistry students to Unit 1, Atomic Structure and Properties. Today we will be focusing on elemental analysis. A lot of science is classifying things. In biology you classified organisms based on how they moved or ate. In uh, physics you classify forces based on what attracts them based on how they respond to one another. In chemistry we focus a lot on classifying compounds based on what holds them together but we also look at their composition. What part of a compound is one element versus another? So it's not very unusual for us to say things like you're 70% water or the Earth's crust is 50% oxygen or the Sun is about 75% hydrogen. We look at the percentage of things to classify and understand that substance or compound. Percent composition or percent by mass is a simple way to look at a substance and to determine how much of a particular element you could receive from a compound. So for example if I have 5 grams of some carbon based compound and 3 grams of it is carbon, what is the percent carbon in it? Percent composition simply means that we will take the mass of carbon and divide by the total mass of the compound times 100. So for this compound 3 grams of carbon divided by 5 grams in total times 100 we find that this compound is 75 percent carbon. Percentages are a part of a total, that total being 100. So if we want to know what percent is the hydrogen, we know that together the hydrogen and the carbon have to equal 100. So we could simply subtract the percent carbon from 100 to find that this compound is 25 percent hydrogen. Now that's a fairly straightforward percent composition. That is not most likely what you would see on your AP exam or even in this class. Most of the time percent composition problems simply provide you the compounds formula. So for example I have ethanol and I want to know what percentage of ethanol is carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. For this we'll just use the molar masses. Since, since this whole compound has a molar mass, what percentage of that molar mass is carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen? We can use that to determine how much of one of those elements we could pull out of it. And while it's not very practical for ethanol to pull out one of these elements, this is how we've determined if it's economically feasible to pull gold out of ores or to smelt things out of different compounds. If we want to find the percent carbon in ethanol, the first thing we're going to need to know is what is the molar mass of our ethanol. So molar mass, remember, means we're going to add up all the elements present. So we have two carbons, six hydrogens, and one oxygen. So we look at our periodic table, carbon is 12.01 grams for each mole and hydrogen is 1.01 grams for each mole and oxygen is 16 grams for each mole. So in total we end up with a molar mass of 46.08 grams for every mole. We're going to use that throughout the rest of this problem. To find the percent carbon, we'll take the molar mass of carbon and divide by the molar mass of ethanol, then multiply by 100. However, it is not one carbon contributing to this mass, there are two of them, so we need to take that into account. The molar mass of two carbons divided by the molar mass of the whole compound. So we'll take 2 times 12.01 grams for each mole and divide by the molar mass of ethanol which we found to be 46.08 grams for each mole. Multiply by 100, we get that the percent composition for this is 52.1 percent carbon. In order to do hydrogen, the percent hydrogen would be 
hydrogen's molar mass divided by the molar mass of ethanol times 100, but there are six hydrogens present, so we need to take into account that there are six hydrogens. So that would be six times 1.01 .01 divided by 46 times 100 to find that this compound is 13.2% hydrogen. For oxygen, we could go the route of taking the molar mass of oxygen and dividing by 46, or we could just as easily subtract since percent composition is a percentage out of 100. So if we simply subtract from 100, 13.2 and 52.1, we can get that the percent oxygen is 34.7%. Again, we use this process in smelting of substances to determine if, if it is economically friendly in order to do so. And while it is not practical to pull carbon out of ethanol, we could figure out how much carbon could be removed from ethanol if we remember that this molar mass assumes that we have a mole of the substance. If we have 10 grams, while not a mole, we could figure out how much carbon we could pull out with that knowledge that 52.1% is carbon. So if we take the mass of 10 grams and multiply by the percentage 52.1%, we can find how many grams of carbon we could remove from ethanol. The percent symbol is, is a mathematical operator. Percent is actually two words. It means per centi. So we don't use 52 mathematically here. We use 52 for each 100. That's what the word percent for each 100 means. So when you go to put this in your calculator, please do not use 52. Please use 10 times point to find that you could extract 55.21 grams of carbon from your 10 gram sample of ethanol. With that being said, you're able to do page 10, 19 in your packet. Please pause the video and complete page 19. On page 19, the first couple compounds listed here are held together by charges. The formulas presented are ionic compounds, which are held together by their charge. Potassium is in the first column of the periodic table, so its oxidation state or charge is plus one. And sulfite is the sulfate ion with one less oxygen. Sulfite is sulfur with three oxygens and two extra electrons, thus it has the oxidative state of minus two. In order to make a neutral compound, you would need two potassiums to cancel out the negative two charge of phosphate, or you might remember this from first year chem, we simply crisscross the numbers down. Two potassiums and one phosphate, one phosphite. However, this formula of two potassiums and one phosphite is not realistic. Phosphite is truly negative, and so potassium surrounds that phosphite. But each of those potassiums are surrounded by a sulfite ion, and each of those sulfite ions are surrounded by phosphate by potassium ions, and the process would go on and on and on forever. However, when we write the formula based on charge, it's the simplest ratio of one ion to another. This simple ratio of two to one is the formula we write for ionic compounds. Ionic compounds form salts. The simplest ratio of one element to another, sometimes called formula units, is known as an empirical formula. The formula unit for potassium sulfite is K2SO3, 
we don't list every single molecule and ion present because it would be an infinite number of potassiums to half an infinite number of sulfites. So an empirical formula is always used for ionic compounds and it simplifies those formulas because they form whole crystal lattices. However, some compounds exist exclusively as molecules, individual substances that travel through space on their own, such as water. Water is a molecule. It's two hydrogens for every one oxygen. And while they can group together and be interested in one another when they form a solid or if they're a liquid, they are still molecules. They just have an attraction for one another. You can still separate them. Water is an example of a covalent compound held together by an attraction for the valence electrons of one atom for the nucleus of another. Covalent compounds, the number of each atom present is given in their formula, known as their molecular formulas. However, you can simplify molecular formulas down to empirical formulas, such as when we talk about hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons, such as glucose, or fructose are known as hydrocarbons because you can simplify them down into carbon with a water. They simplify down to their empirical formula and it gives us a good idea. So both of these are used for storing energy. Hydrocarbons all have the same empirical formula. An empirical formula is, is the simplified version of a molecular formula. So for example, tetraphosphorus decaoxide simplifies down by pulling out a two, giving us P2O5. Water's empirical formula simplifies down to nothing. Water is the simplest ratio it can go to. Two to one is two to one. So sometimes they do overlap. Covalent compounds, their empirical and molecular formulas are related simply by simplifying down. Going from the molecular to an empirical formula is simply a matter of simplifying. So for this first one, write the empirical formula for water. Water two to one is as simple as we're gonna get. Meanwhile, ethyne, we could pull a two out of ethyne, giving us C1H1. Diarsenic pentoxide, we could pull a two out as well, giving us one arsenic for every five oxygens. An empirical formula, again, just asks you to simplify, to pull out that number that, they, that the subscripts all have in common. Going from the the empirical formula back to the molecular formula, however, requires a little bit more work. You have to determine what number was extracted when they reduced it. Empirical and molecular formulas are related by their molar masses. Diarsenic pentoxide has a molar mass of 160 grams for every mole. Its molecular formula has a molar mass of 320 grams for every mole. So the number they had to have pulled out could be found simply by dividing these two, taking the molar mass of the molecular formula, 320, and dividing by the molar mass of the empirical formula, 160, to find that they pulled a two out of the equation. So we'll put a two back into our formula, P2O5, becomes P4O10. So let's do one of these. Here we have a hydrocarbon. Its molar mass is 180 grams per mole. What is its molecular formula? We are going to need to take this number the molar mass of the molecular formula and, com and compare it to the molar mass of the empirical formula. So our empirical formula is a carbon, two hydrogens, and one oxygen. So 12 plus two times one plus 16 is 30 grams for each mole. So we'll take the molar mass of our molecular formula and divide by the molar mass of our empirical formula. 
to figure out what number they extracted. 180 grams for each mole divided by 30 tells us they pulled a 6 out. So we are going to plug a 6 back into our formula to give us that this is C6H12O6. If you decide to major in chemistry, your career path is unlimited. However, two of the largest draws from, from chemists are to either go into pharmaceutical chemistry, where you either become a pharmacist or you go into pharmacy research, making new compounds is where the big bucks are, but requires a lot of work. Or you become a forensic chemist, which still requires a lot of work, but that job is all the fun. If you liked watching CSI, that was your gig. Part of a forensic chemist's job is to find out what an unknown compound is. Police officers will often bring you unknown compounds and say, okay, what is this white powder? You can't lick it and go, that's cocaine, because that's a good way to lose your job. So what we do in order to determine what an unknown powder is, is we burn it. Because when we burn things, we react it with oxygen. So if I have some unknown compound made of A and B, and I burn it, if you remember from first year chem, burning or combustion reactions are when oxygen partners with those elements. And so you always end up with the same product. You always end up with oxides of whatever you burn. So A oxide and B oxide. So if you start with a hydrocarbon, C carbon and hydrogen, you end up with carbon dioxide and water. Since we always end up with the same compounds, we can start extracting them based on their chemical properties. In either case, this process is known as gravimetric or elemental analysis to figure out what percentage of the compound was A and what percentage of the compound was B. And from those percentages, we can convert them back to an empirical formula and eventually a molecular formula. Now, this is a step-by-step -step process, not just in the lab, but actually to calculate it. And the process was taught to me by a colleague when I first started teaching, Miss Freeman. Miss Freeman taught her students to memorize the poem, percent to mass, mass to mole, divide by small, multiply till whole, in order to do elemental analysis. And so it's what I use. Percent to mass, mass to mole, divide by small, multiply till whole. This poem will allow you to figure out the empirical formula because each step pertains to the steps we take in order to find the empirical formula. So let's just learn by doing. The first part of our poem is percent to mass. If you're given an empirical formula's percent composition, we are going to assume you have a 100 gram sample. And this is the easiest step of the poem. We're simply going to change the percent signs to grams. If your professor gives you grams, you don't have to do the step. You're already in grams. But we need to be in grams in order to play this game. So 43% phosphorus becomes 43 grams of phosphorus and 56 56% oxygen becomes 56 grams of oxygen. The next step of our poem is mass to mole. I told you one of the biggest things you'll have to do in this class, one of the most important things you'll do in this class is to figure out how many moles you have. And this is where that comes into play. In order to go from grams to moles, we use the molar mass off the periodic table. So one mole of phosphorus is 30.97 grams. And one mole of oxygen is 16 grams. So we'll take 43.64 and divide by 30.97 to get that we have 1.409 moles of phosphorus. And we'll take 56.36 and divide by 16 to get that we have 3.5225 moles of oxygen. The next step of our poem is divide by small. 
divide by small means divide by the least number of moles because a formula is simply the ratio of one moles of one atom to moles of another atom. So we'll divide both of these by the least number of moles present, which happens to be our phosphorus. So we'll divide both of these by 0.14. At this point, it is good to make some rounding errors. So grabbing one or two decimal places to divide by small will help you along the way because we're gonna make some wide rounding uh, in our next step. So I'm going to divide by 1.4 simply because it kind of works well. So 1.4 divided by 1.4 tells me I have one phosphorus. 3.5 divided by 1.4 tells me I have two and a half oxygens. Notice again, I'm not going through all the calculator vomit. I'm just kind of grabbing the first decimal place and running with it. If these were whole numbers, we could stop here because our final step is to multiply till whole. Whole means that that first decimal place, zero point something, if that first decimal place is a zero, a one, an eight sometimes, or a nine, if that first decimal place is a one, eight, or nine, or a zero, we're gonna say that's a whole number. You can stop and that's your ratio. So one phosphorus to two and a half oxygens, nay, nay. That's not a whole number. So we can't stop here. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna multiply till you get that decimal to play nicely, till it comes out to uh, zero, one, eight, or nine. Eight being sometimes. So what we'll do is we'll multiply by two. If two doesn't work, if that doesn't give me the numbers I want, I'll multiply everybody by three. And if that doesn't work, I'll multiply everybody by four. And if that doesn't work, I'll multiply everybody by five. And if you have to multiply anything other than anything larger than five, chances are you might have done messed up somewhere. See your professor. For right now, let's multiply by two. One times two is two. So I have two phosphorus. Two and a half times two is 5.0. And even if I retain the decimal places off the calculator, I end up with 5.032. That is really close to being five. So it's two phosphorus for every five oxygens. That's my empirical formula. We've done the poem. Percent to mass, mass to mole, divide by small, multiply to whole. That's how you find the empirical formula. Our final step is to use that empirical formula, P2O5, to figure out what our compound's molecular formula is. So again, to find our molecular formula, we need to figure out what number they reduce this by. So we'll take the molecular formula's molar mass, and we'll divide by the empirical formula's molar mass. So two phosphorus and five oxygens. So two times 30.97 plus five times 16 gives us 221.94 grams for each mole. Gives us 141.94 grams for each mole. So 283.88 divided by 141 is approximately two. So that means that we're going to take our empirical formula and plug that two back into it to find that our molecular formula is P4O10. Changing gears slightly just to make room for our lab today, because we will be doing a lab, let's finish by talking about the difference between a mixture and a pure substance. If you were to receive a baggie from the police and it was just that tetraphosphorus deca oxide, that would be known as a pure substance. However, when you were to pass it through your incinerator, it would be possible that some of the bag might go through it. Some of the particles of the bag might attach to those molecules of tetraphosphorus decaoxide, and that would make it a mixture. 
there would be impurities present. We can use elemental analysis to determine how pure a substance is. If our numbers come out really nice, if all of the sample is one thing and all of the sample is another, we can say there's definitely a pure substance there. But if we had received this data that it was 43% phosphorus and 63 and 56% oxygen, and there was some small percentage, like 0.001% carbon, and like 6 times 10 to the negative 34th percent hydrogen. That would be a clue to us that there were impurities present in this sample. These are too small to use in our poem. If we included them, it would be something along the lines of like 200 phosphorus and 5,000 oxygens to one carbon. So those impurities would show up in our mixture. What's not considered an impurity is if your sample is a hydrate. Some ionic compounds are hydrophilic. They suck moisture out of the air and trap that moisture between their ions. When the ions are formed from transition metals, they tend to have colors. For example, copper is blue or teal, and cobalt is usually a very pinkish color. Uh, tin is typically kind of yellowish. But those hydrates, you can remove the water vapor from by heating them. If I heat up copper sulfate, it goes from being this bluish color to being mostly white or off blue when it's the anhydrate form. The number of hydrogens is simply listed as, as the prefixes you've learned so far. Mono is one, two is di. We write their formulas with a dot between the ionic compound and the number of waters present. So this actually is a typo here. Copper sulfate dihydride dihydrate would be CuSO4 dot 2 H2O. When we find how many waters are present, this 2 is the ratio, the mole to mole ratio of moles of water versus moles of salt. Much like our empirical formula is a ratio of moles of phosphorus to moles of oxygen. So we will end today by doing a lab where I'm going to give you a copper chloride compound. Copper chloride is fairly hydrophilic. It will pull water into it. Your job today is to get, as, get all of the water out and then react it with aluminum to pull the copper out because later we will uh, figure out what the exact formula of our copper chloride is. When you work on the lab, if you were not present in the lab, I will ask you to join one of your classmates who was. So come see me to get your data for the lab. If you were not in class, though, I would like you to practice empirical molecular formulas. Please do page 20. Only if you were not present in class. If you were present in class, doing the lab will take the place of you having to do page 20. If you were not present in class, I expect you to have page 20 done. And with that being said, after you guys have completed the lab, I will be giving you a take-home quiz as well as having the online quizzes for you to take for Unit 1.2. Please make sure you do your online quizzes because they will be due when we take our test, which is coming up at the end of the week, most likely. And I will see you next time when we talk about atomic structure.